Thanks very much, Jim. Um, and of course, uh, thanks to the, our hosts here. Uh, it's, it's stunning that the firm has uh, offices in five states, my gosh. Uh, but this is a picture from their website that I like the best. Uh, their, 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 their agricultural side. Their, you, you, run, you, uh, you operate this personally, don't you, Christian? You, you yeah, it's my, uh, it's my garage. <laughs> <laughs> um, so <laughs> this is where it started. This is why marijuana got into Schedule One. This kind of propaganda, uh, and this is why it should come out of Schedule One. Um, last Friday, that's Civic Center Park. Um, it's a, an event that you're all familiar with, um, and I, I just love that post. I got stoned and did my taxes. In other words, it's really helping the government because she said, the poster really said that this was helping her do her taxes. I mean, she, she, was, uh, she was feeling terrible about doing her taxes and then look what, look what cannabis did for her. Okay. <laughs> uh, we need so just a couple of basic terms that most of you know, maybe all of you do, so I'll be quick about it. Um, we, we keep re reading the terms cannabis, marijuana, and hemp. Uh, historically, they all mean the same thing, this plant. Um, uh, it, it's uh, been known since ancient times. Herodotus, the very first Western historian who invented the word history for us, um, mentions it. And uh, old Chinese texts also. Um, it's been around a long, long time. Um, cannabis is the Greek name. and Typically, that got adopted as the uh, technical bot botanical name. And uh, hemp just comes straight through from Old English. Marijuana is a much more modern term that arose somewhere in Mexico. It's kind of obscure where it came from. But we corrupted it in the, in the United States to call it marijuana. Uh, Mary Jane, we just think that's a lot of fun. That, that's not the Mexican term. Anyway. <coughs> uh, we now have separate marijuana and hemp. This is a modern device. We say hemp is this, uh, the varieties of the plant that are low in uh, THC, the, <coughs> the uh, principal intoxicating agreement, uh, agreement, uh, ingredient. There are a couple more, but it, this is the main one. And um, hemp is instead defined as having such a low level that it uh, Allegedly, you can't get stoned on it. Um, and uh, this definition that we started using in Colorado has now been embedded in federal law. The feds have just legalized hemp. But this talk tonight is about marijuana, not hemp. That's just getting the terms out uh, in case it matters. Uh, if, you ha if anyone has any questions any time, hop in. I don't care. I mean, about you don't have to wait. So. One of the questions that keeps coming up wherever I go is, did we make, were we right to legalize? And for other states, should they legalize? There's still, there's still only 10 states that have fully legalized. There are 40 states that are asking this question. So I'm going to run through the various arguments that are constantly raised. Uh, there are also their arguments made here in Colorado about why we should repeal what we did. I don't think that's likely to happen, but you never know. Uh, so when you start listing the arguments in favor, uh, the, one of the leading ones, of course, is medical use. And another is revenue. We get money from this. We get tax money. Hmm, great. And uh, we, should, uh, we should replace the illegal market, which has all kinds of problems associated with that. Uh, with a legal market, um, and, uh, and why was it made illegal in the first place when it's a fairly harmless substance? Arguments against, and you hear these all the time. Um, there's DUI, uh, and it, it, that is a problem. Uh, there's an, uh, an old claim that's uh, pretty much tired now that uh, marijuana makes every worker unproductive. 
I don't think there's any proof of it, but you hear it now and again. Um, heavy users who start young uh, have significant levels of psychiatric illness, and there are some environmental issues. It uses a lot of electricity to go up, grow indoors. Uh, California grows, use too much water, and uh, there's the smell. Claim that it's a gateway drug. This was, this was Jeff Sessions' favorite. He used this one over and over. Oh, soon, next thing you know, as soon as you're using marijuana, next thing you know, they'll be hooked on heroin. Oh, my, my. And there was the old claim from the 30s to the 70s that it makes people violent and induces them to commit criminal acts and things like that. And then, of course, the, the fallback is always, it's immoral. Um, no, no, no surprise that um, there are a lot of fake claims on both sides, although I think the prohibitionists make more of them. And then we have the modern twist for fakery, um, fake studies. There are, all, there are a bunch of studies that are fake. And, um, and the social media broadcasts whatever happens. And we always have to, when we talk about the social media, we always have to bring in the Russians, although I don't think they're too much involved in this subject. But uh, here, the, <laughs> the immoral claim, of course, brings about the basis for what we did here in Colorado. We, should, we said it should be treated like alcohol because there are so many parallels to the two substances. And I fully agree with that. In fact, I'm going to amplify the idea uh, toward the end of this talk. The medical claims. Um, lots of them. It's, uh, you know, it's snake oil. It cures everything. Cures cancer, um, heart disease, you name it. Uh, you can find any claim you want. Medical science has said that some of these uses actually do work. Uh, the most important is as a painkiller, and of course as a painkiller it's a lot safer than opioids. In fact, the data are pretty clear that legalizing states have reduced levels of opioid abuse. Isn't that good? Uh, it's a recognized treatment for uh, epileptic seizures. Um, and the, the latest claim is as a treatment for autism. And I'll tell you, if that one works, uh, there's no way they'll ever uh, reverse legalization. On the other hand, it is an herbal medicine. And herbal medicines, by definition, have no uh, definite uh, co composition. They vary considerably depending on uh, the, the sub-variety of each uh, plant and uh, uh, whether it's a modern hybrid and so forth and so on. And so the, a lot of the medical people say that you shouldn't, you shouldn't uh, be using uh, this kind of medicine. That, that, you know, that's, not, that's not good science. You should use the extract, extract the ingredients, uh, match them up. Um, with, a, with, enough, with enough research, we could make all the useful things without consuming marijuana, but just consuming the extracts. And of course, uh, the psychiatric harm to uh, heavy users does have reasonable proof. In fact, within the medical community, the psychiatrists are the most uh, uh, diligently opposed to legalization. They, they sound off all the time. Well, let's talk about revenue. How about all that money? Uh, we have high license fees. We have high taxes, um, uh, both state and local. And uh, you, you read every, every once in a while, you'll read the, an, another statement in the Denver Post about how many millions of dollars the state is taking in, blah, blah, blah. If you then look at the actual budget, you'll see that in the current budget, the budget that we're using right now, uh, marijuana revenue is listed at about 2%, uh, not including fines for illegal activities. And um, uh, it's all allocated, well, it's allocated first of all just to pay for the system of regulation, which is very uh, essential, but then the extra right now in this year's budget 
is allocated 100% to public school construction for poor school districts, a, a crucial um, need. In, in fact, it's, the, it's sort of the, the biggest problem in the whole school funding uh, system. Uh, the, the, the state does a good job of equalizing operational funds for our public schools, but uh, construction money usually depends on the local property tax. So if you're in a poor district with poor property values, you're, you're in trouble. And the, the money is being, even though the money's not that much in terms of the whole budget, it's being targeted at that use until yesterday. When our leaders in the um, legislature announced that they want to shift it from that construction use to pay for this kindergarten program that the governor wants. I think personally it was a mistake. I think that so much that I immediately emailed uh, some of the, our legislators saying so. They haven't answered. Uh, but in any case, um, uh, the reason it's a mistake is that it's not that much money if they if they if they fund um, well here let, let's get on with the rest of the information denver gets somewhat more from uh, the city of denver gets somewhat more from uh, taxes on cannabis and license fees around four percent uh, that includes some money that's a straight pass through from the state the whole system is quite complicated with lots of rules um, and the Mayor Hancock has said that from now on, uh, after paying for regulation, it's all going to be allocated to affordable housing. I think that's part of his re-election campaign, blah, blah, blah. But the key question for those of interested in the policy, uh, policies is, can the state and the city count on this revenue source? And I think the answer is no. Now, I don't think the feds are going to start cracking down again. That's not the reason. But cannabis is not expensive to grow. It's only expensive because it's illegal. And it's, it's still somewhat illegal. Um, uh, I think that uh, if it gets fully legalized, or when it gets fully legalized, which I think it will be, that the tax revenue is going to fall because the price is going to fall. And uh, here's a comparison. Uh, Alcohol revenue for the state is about 18% of, of, of um, marijuana revenue, even though we sell a lot more alcohol than we do marijuana. Uh, uh, what happens in Canada will be kind of a test of this question, you know, because in Canada, the, the, all these restraints are being removed. And so if it really is cheap to grow, then it, that's going to show up. So. You know, to go back a second, um, uh, can, my, my concern is that if they shift this money to kindergarten, and the kindergarten program relies on it, and then the revenue falls, uh, that's going to leave a hole for, the, you know, they need to face up, the legislature needs to face up to how to fund the kindergarten program without this crutch. This is wrong. Um, it, it's the targeted use for poor school construction is much a, a much better one. So anyway, there's there's one of my um, is one of my political pitches of the day. Another reason to legalize, as I said, is safety and jobs. Um, illegal markets, of course, and in, uh, involve uh, contaminated goods. Uh, uh, processing marijuana uh, by the cheapest method. Uh, which is illegal, but that's we're in an illegal market. So what uh, causes fires and explosions, and of course generates uh, violence, and of course workers in the in the field have no protection. So it's just better to legalize and and have all of these activities lawful. Pretty easy claim. The claim that um, pot, pot use makes all workers less productive is clearly false. And uh, on the other hand, it's not a big industry. It's not as if uh, we're going to have tons and tons of jobs. Uh, as usual, automation will cut back on the workforce and in time. If it, again, Canada will be a nice test of that. 
Uh, and the DUI, pro DUI problem is a genuine problem. And it, when you use both of them together, apparently it's wor worse. Environmental issues. You get these environmental claims. Um, one is that they, they come up with these massive numbers of power use to grow marijuana indoors. Um, and of course, the, the smells claims are all over the place. But the power use thing is, is a byproduct of history and of current illegality. So why, do, why is so much of it grown indoors when it actually grows outdoors just fine? And the answer is that when it's illegal, of course it was being grown indoors. I mean, duh, right? That's how you, that's how you got away with it, was you grew it indoors. So there's a, there's a big accumulated expertise in indoor growing, and then uh, it's still illegal in most of the state of Colorado. So you still can't grow it outdoors. Most of the rural parts of the state, it's still illegal. So you can't grow it outdoors anyway. Um, but, and smells, of course, smells are a problem in society anyway. And there's, we have nuisance laws and ways to take care of smells. That's not a problem. One thing about smells is to note that the trend is very much toward eating and away from smoking, which should have some effect on smells. Um, the, over half the sales of recreational now are uh, edibles, and, um, and the, the, it's rising. But here's, a, here's an odor event that, that occurred a while ago um, at an IHOP in, in St. Louis, of all places, where nothing's legal. So. <laughs> Um, uh, question. So I, I think you also you've forgotten to take into account the cost to the state of that marijuana from law enforcement and incarceration. We're not arresting people for marijuana and putting them in prison. We're putting them in a job where they can be arrested. Well, I'm getting there. It's coming. All right. Uh, no, I agree with that. Uh, I, I'm just the. What I was trying to do is say that, uh, that if, if the issue were, should we legalize for medical, should we legalize for revenue, should we legalize for safety, you can make a fair debate against those grounds for legalization, and the prohibitionists do. And the prohibitionists are well-funded. There, there's a lot of uh, effort met, met, uh, going on to uh, stop, and they're, and they're successful. But still only 10 states. and they. We had the big failure in New Jersey where the governor was behind it, but the legislature wouldn't go along, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, uh, but, and this is, this is uh, based on the last question too, use of, use of the state power to criminalize this substance is nuts. Uh, it was, it's wrong morally, it's wrong practically, and that, that's what makes legalization a, a no-brainer. It's clearly right for that reason. We should not be treating this substance the way we do. We, you know, all the resources that go into that, um, it's not nearly harmful enough to justify pro prohibition. Um, the, 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 the regime that's used is a massive failure. Talk about a, a legal regime that hasn't worked. This is a po poster child for that. Uh, it's scarred with racial and ethnic pre prejudice, staggering secondary costs, police, jails, seizure, rap sheets, all, all the things on the slide. Uh, and the latest negative is it's being used to, uh, uh, by the government to harass uh, uh, non-citizens, including perfectly legal ones. I mean, green card... If you, if you have a green card and you go through five years and it's time to get your, your uh, uh, citizenship, oh, you can't be a citizen. You smoked a joint or you, you worked for the, those people in Colorado. Um, yeah. And, of course, one of the twists is that, uh, this is the other side of the coin, is that uh, uh, forbidding its use is causing some hiring difficulties for some businesses in a tight labor market. We'll talk a little about that in a minute. Um, so I'm just going to go back over those, uh, those grounds why uh, legalization is clearly right. Uh, there's just no, 
How many people have died from alcohol poisoning? How many people have died from uh, cigarette smoking? Um, uh, thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions, worldwide millions. Um, there's no proven case where in consumption of marijuana has killed anybody. There's some secondary deaths, but they are a small number. Um, the psychiatric harm is, is real, but it, it's not as bad as that from alcoholism. Uh, and uh, the DUI thing is the same problem as for alcohol. We don't, we don't treat alcohol as a Schedule I drug on that ground. And uh, the gateway and violence claims are just phony. Uh, every, every attempt to test for them uh, backs that up. So the harms just aren't even close to those for cigarettes or alcohol. Some people then say, well, wait a minute. If you smoke it, aren't you going to get um, lung cancer the same way as for cigarettes? Well, it does harm lungs, but that, that's ignorance about how marijuana is consumed. You don't smoke two packs a day of joints. It's not, that's not the way it's consumed. You might have three a day or something if you're a heavy user, but it's the two packs a day that take, take your lungs out. So what a, what a case for a failed policy. Uh, 1970, we put it in um, Schedule I. Since then, it's become much more available, much more used, um, cheaper, um, more potent forms. Uh, and in other words, if you were trying to find a policy that's a waste of time because it doesn't work, this is, a, this is just pure. The racism. This takes a little history. Um, the first moves to outlaw marijuana were in the states, of course, as typical in, the, in America, including Colorado. We outlawed it in the teens sometimes. And, but most of those were tied to the move to outlaw uh, booze. And that was not particularly racist in most places. Texas is an exception. Texas deliberately said we're outlawing marijuana because of those uh, you know, whatever slang you want to use for Hispanic people. Uh, but other than that, it wasn't associated with, uh, with race, racial issues. Then in 1930, uh, Harry Anslinger, who's running the, uh, the prohibition system for the feds, is looking at the handwriting on the wall. Oh my God, prohibition's going to be repealed. What am I going to do? And so he hits upon the idea of going after marijuana. He himself had earlier said it's a completely harmless substance. He just flipped out of self-interest and started saying it's terrible stuff. And uh, then, then, of course, this film was made, Reefer Madness, in 36. Um, it was made by private interest, but I'm sure Harry was helping out. And uh, then we had the Marijuana Tax Act. That, that thing went quiet for a while, nothing much you know, the Marijuana Tax Act was not enforced too vigorously. But uh, in the 60s, uh, marijuana became popular with civil rights and anti-Vietnam causes. And um, so then when they got around to drafting <laughs> the, the uh, Schedule One, I mean, excuse me, the, the Controlled Substances Act, they were happy to put it in Schedule One because by that time, uh, the government's attitude toward these hippies was not too, not too favorable. Um, the states then copied the CSA. Every state did at first. Some backed off very quickly, but most of them didn't, including us. Uh, and enforcement of the marijuana laws in practice, state and federal, became very prejudicial against uh, African Americans, even though the use rates are no different. Why? Well, of course, there's always racial prejudice in society, but uh, there's some practical reasons as well. Uh, because there's less privacy in the ghetto, uh, marijuana use is more likely in public. And the police have these crime prevention schemes to stop and frisk and so forth and so on. Oh, don't find a gun, but look, there's that baggie, there's that joint, like, run them in. And modern police forces have systems of reward based on the number of arrests you make. And no, there's nothing softer than a marijuana possession arrest to just pad those numbers.
data from everywhere in the country show uh, a big uh, uh, disparity in arrests uh, for marijuana between uh, white folks and, and uh, black and brown folks. Here are the numbers for Colorado. Um, the, before the, in the years right before we legalized, uh, black people were about 4% of our state population and accounted for 22% of arrests. Well, what about incarceration? That, uh, you know, isn't that, when you start thinking about criminal law, you have to stop and think, well, aren't we the incarceration leaders of the world? Yes, we are. There are the data for you if you want. Uh, uh, our national number, we, we incarcerate 698 per 100,000. This is, there's a, there's a, uh, not, there's a, an NGO that keeps track of this stuff very carefully. Uh, you can find these numbers online easily. Um, and uh, look at the contrast with Canada. 16% uh, of what we incarcerate. So you think, isn't marijuana part of the problem here? Well, I have to qualify this a little bit. Um, it turns out that uh, uh, inmates in state prisons do not have a high percentage of marijuana convicts. A lot, a lot of drug uh, use, there are a lot of drug offenses in the prisons, but not, not so many marijuana. So the, uh, the prohibitionists say, well, you're not going to cure this problem if you legalize. It's just not, that's not where the problem is. The mistake in that argument is to talk just about prisons. Uh, if you then shift from prisons to jails, that is the local jails, the percent of marijuana convicts goes up. And if you talk about those waiting for trial, it goes up again. And, if, and on pure arrests, it goes up to, it goes through the roof. Uh, so look at those numbers for marijuana arrests. Um, that, you know, that's just a number out of nowhere, but here's a, here's a comparison. That's roughly the same as the cumulative number for all arrests for all violent crimes per year. In other words, we arrest about the same number of people for marijuana as we do for all violent crimes put together. That just cannot be a sensible policy. In addition, the biggest chunk of folks uh, uh, subject to the criminal justice system are people on probation, more than half or the people subject to the system are on probation, and marijuana is a big chunk of those folks. And that just creates all this collateral harm uh, that we've been talking about. So. Wasted resources, um, there may not be that many prisoners who are in there for marijuana, but everyone who is uh, seems to me to be wrongfully there, and look at the cost of it. 39,000, uh, this is 20, 2015, it's more now, um, but 39,000 a year per prisoner. They, police time is used, jail space is used, the police are um, uh, diverted from useful work. Um, here, and then of course, if you really wanna know how bad it can get, you have to look at places like Louisiana. These are two quite notorious cases from uh, the state of Louisiana. Well, uh, Mr. Winslow, who's still in there, still in Angola. Look at those facts. That, I mean, that's astonishing. They finally let Mr. Noble out on parole. But of course, in Louisiana, you're out on parole. You can't vote. Anyway, we do have a big disparity in incarceration rates in the United States. Uh, the rates for Louisiana, five, over five times that for Massachusetts. And Louisiana is only number two. The most the most lockup state of all is Oklahoma. Yes, sir. Yes. That they did. That's right. It might be. Um, uh, although I think the dominant issue was uh, was its use uh, in uh, uh, death penalty cases. Uh, but yeah, it, you're right, and it was a good thing they changed it. I was glad to see that. And uh, 
when you're talking about wasting resources, um, you run up against, we get into the market. So uh, lots of businesses still say we won't employ anybody who's, who uses marijuana. A medical card doesn't matter to us. And so we have this notorious case about the gentleman who was fired by Dish Network, went to the Supreme Court, and, and he lost. The, the firing was uh, upheld. Um, but markets, hooray, hooray. Um, the, the military used to have a rule that if you had a record of use of marijuana, we will not let you enlist. They had to abandon that because uh, they couldn't fill their quotas. And uh, there's some skilled occupations where it's even worse because, I mean, the, in the military, they still, once you enlist, they still say, now you have to stop. But some other occupations, um, to, to, keep, to keep some very skilled computer programmers in some fields and some uh, things like that, they have, to, they have to let them keep on using. Markets are helping. And of course, we have a tight labor market anyway, so. So anyway, where are we? Well, of course, legalization is incomplete. Let's see where we are, okay. Uh, the biggest problem, of course, is the continued federal illegality uh, makes, makes production and sale much more expensive than it should be. Um, banking, income tax, a bunch of, I could go on and on about the ways federal law causes a problem. Uh, the feds threaten to crack down on us if we let it get into <coughs> Nebraska, oh my gosh. Um, and we were even sued by Nebraska about that. Uh, uh, and we have this problem that of course, although we've legalized it in Colorado, and we've legalized personal possessions of small amounts, most of the state doesn't allow any commerce in, in marijuana. This is, a, this is a slightly old map, I couldn't find a newer one. But it all that green is places where there's no legal commerce. And th that's one reason that you, you don't have a lot of uh, marijuana plants being grown outdoors, because rural Colorado says no. Because we've made it expensive, the illegal market still competes. That's a, that's a problem. Um, uh, that's a complicated story that I could give details about, but anyway. Uh, and, of course, our arrests are down, but the disparity against black and brown uh, persons is still there, just as much as ever. One of the reasons for that is that we still don't allow public consumption, for, for, except with rare exceptions. Uh, the, the lack of privacy problem is still there. The, the, the t stop and frisk problem is still there. Uh, the only place public consumption is formally legalized is, is here in Denver. And Denver has had made the rules so strict that what, what are they, is it two places? Two, yeah, that's what I thought. So it's, it's virtually still illegal everywhere. Now it is true that we have these uh, clubs, especially in Colorado Springs, that, that is a way to semi-public consumption, but it's still a, a problem, and the clubs are not going to be uh, not going to solve the problem of the ghetto. So, what should we be doing? Remedies? Well, obviously, fixing federal law is something we still have to get there. Um, state and local laws can reduce the commercial costs. They can absolutely stop possession arrests. Right now, we, we've, we've made it legal to, to possess an ounce, but if you've got more than an ounce, they still, they still bust you. Uh, they could just stop possession arrests altogether, and they should. Uh, if we got more legally, legal places in rural Colorado, we could shift uh, production outdoors and get rid of some of the indoor production difficulties. Uh, there's a massive backlog of research needs of every sort because the, the, the DEA makes it so too difficult. But now I'm going to get a little bit off the, the standard path. So let's go back to the comparison or the match between alcohol and marijuana, uh, which here's, here's the most fundamental way 
they are the same. Uh, moderate consumption of both of them seems to be safe. I mean, there are arguments about it, but moderate consumption seems to be safe and may be beneficial. The, the medical uses of marijuana, the, the claims that you know a glass of wine a day will reduce your chance of heart disease. Uh, so we have this very close match in a very fundamental way. We have these two substances that people enjoy, want to consume, and if used in moderation, um, there's really no problem for society. Uh, on the other hand, both of them used to excess start to create problems. Um, alcohol more than marijuana, but it's true that heavy use of either one is not a good thing. The United Nations does alcohol studies co that compare nations across the world. These studies, for, first of all, show that, well, they, they rather clearly show that moderation is the answer. Um, so if you, if you start comparing uh, nations and alcohol use across the country, you find that the lowest rates, for the most part, are uh, Islamic countries, where it's either against the law or it's against God's law in any way. And anyway, God's helping out is the point. Um, and prohibition basically only works with the help of God. I mean, there's no, there's no example of prohibition working other than, other than that way. So it works, it works for Mormons in Utah because God is telling them what to do. But prohibition otherwise doesn't work. So you look at the comparative data for the world and you look at these really low rates of uh, problems with alcohol. The, the, the UN does data on um, alcohol, both kinds of alcohol abuse, the kind that causes you, uh, well, the kind that gets you hooked, you're an alcoholic, and the kind that, that harms your body in other ways. And they have separate data for those. And the data are very startling because among using nations, there's only one that comes close to matching the Islamic countries, and it's Italy. Well, why is that? If you start thinking about it, and you think about what you know about Italy, well, the answer is the way Italians consume alcohol. With meals, not in taverns. Fermented, not hard stuff. And the meals are not fast, right? You know, at least this is my theory. The problem is nobody does research on this. Uh, but, but it seems to me it's clear that not only is moderation better, but it's better taken with food. So regulation could take this into account. Uh, we could make moderate consumption cheaper and make the other kind much more expensive. There are political barriers to doing this. The tavern lobby is very strong. Um, the vodka makers will be in there with, you know, bribing congressmen right and left. But anyway, I, I'm free to say these things anyway. Um, maybe the same thing's true for marijuana. We don't have the research. We don't know. But it's certainly plausible. Certainly moderate use is clearly better. We know that. But it's also plausible that, that uh, taking it with with food is better. We don't know, we, but research is needed. And another, something happened to my slide there. <laughs> another thing is the, is the problem of the way we do education. I mean, our education about alcohol and marijuana is all about abstinence. We do a better, oh yeah. Oh, there's a, there's a recent, pl I, I got, I'm sorry, this slide screwed up. But there's a new British study uh, that finds that uh, if you have, if you have uh, marijuana products, they have a higher level of CBD. It, you know, keep, keep this THC level the same. Raise the level of CBD, it makes it safer. It's an interesting new study. Uh, it just shows you we need all kinds of research on these things. Um, and then we have this problem of our, our education is entirely about abstinence. Um, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. They're all out of order. Okay. Yeah, okay. 
I mean, we do better with sex education. Uh, we, you know, that there are people who say sex education should only be about abstinence, but our, our education about marijuana and uh, alcohol is all about abstinence. It's we never, there's never any direction toward moderation. Uh, and uh, it plagues the system. Because again, without God's help, abstinence doesn't work. I mean, the prohibitions don't work. So if you're going to really improve people's health with regard to marijuana, you, you need to consider uh, ways to promote moderation. Yes, sir? <laughs> uh, I, I'm not, that, that sounds plausible, but I'm, I'm not familiar with those. But yeah. oh yeah, it, make, it makes sense that that could happen for sure, no, no doubt. <laughs> anyway, so my final slide is that there's a there's certainly a global business going on. Uh, Canada has legalized. Uh, Uruguay has legalized. Um, uh, uh, Portugal has gone completely uh, off the uh, criminal enforcement method, even though it's technically illegal, but they, you go to a social worker instead of a jail. Um, and uh, so, you know, there's a worldwide explosion of things happening, and uh, we undoubtedly could learn a lot from, from a lot of these places and things. This is the kind of stuff that comes up on my computer screen every day. Uh, kind of induced me to go to something like this. Um, anyway, so that's all I have unless questions. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, I agree. Christian. There are all kinds of, of discussions about how the an alternative methods of taxation, but if you did shift it, you'd need another positive Tabor vote. Now, ta Tabor votes to legalize taxes are, are easy only when a lot of voters say, he's going to pay, I'm not. That's why hotel taxes are so easy to get uh, consent for. Uh, and that's the way tobacco taxes are. Uh, uh, tobacco now is, uh, is a very much a lower class thing. You know, it's a, um, the, the, 
the poorest people in Colorado are the smokers. Um, and um, so uh, you can always do that, but the, the fundamental problem of paying for schools and kindergartens is, needs a much more robust, cross the board kind of tax. And uh, the, the legislators are, so, are too timid about Tabor. They, don't, they, they keep coming up with stupid ways to deal with it. We, Amendment 73 that we voted on, so complicated, so comp It was an abominable drafting job. If any lawyer had anything to do with that, he should be disbarred. It was terrible. Um, uh, you know, in other words, we don't tackle Tabor issues wisely. I mean, it's just amazing to me. Uh, time after time, stupid things are put on the ballot and don't pass. Oh, well, w wake up. And, Well, the approach to Tabor is always taken in a partisan way, and that's not going to work. You, get, you, you have to have some bipartisan buy-in to get anything done. There's this organization that Dan Ritchie started. You know who Dan Ritchie is? Uh, the, the, the guy who was head of DU for years and did a lot of good for DU, to say the least. Uh, anyway, he started an organization called um, Build Better Colorado, BBD, BBCO, Build a Better Colorado. Go online and look at it. It is a studiously politically sent with a it's, a, it's governing board is carefully balanced between Democrats, Republicans, and unaffiliated. Um, and 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 uh, it's the one that got a bunch of things done in 2016. They backed and uh, got on the ballot. The, um, the, the they they backed the uh, open primary laws. They they, they are behind Amendment 71, which was controversial, but it shows how effective they are. This year, they're going around the state studying um, uh, the relationship between Tabor, um, Gallagher, and uh, Amendment 23. And um, if anyone's going to get anything positive done, they'll do it because they, they've got bipartisan backing. And that's what you've got to have. That, that's a little aside thing, nothing to do with this talk, I'm sorry. Any, any other thoughts, questions about marijuana? Uh, no, because I, I, I only read it as a, a, a headline today. It's a brand new study. Yeah, and yeah. Pardon? Yep, yeah. And DUI marijuana exacerbates a problem that's inherent in all DUI laws, um, which is, of course, that you, you set these numbers, like uh, you are presumptively a drunk driver if your blood alcohol level is 0 0.1, 0 0.08, 0 0.05, whatever you name it. Um, uh, the problem, of course, is that um, there's a terrific variation in individuals. Some people at 0.1 are a danger to society and others are in pretty good control. And apparently the, 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 that differential is even greater for marijuana. So there's a, there is a problem. You may, we may have to fall back on, on field tests, you know, walk the line, that kind of thing. Because 
that's the one way you, you, you really know whether somebody's impaired, not based on what's in their bloodstream or something. But it, I mean, it's a problem, but um, it can be solved. Uh, the Scandinavian countries have gotten to the point where the driver always holds off, doesn't drink. So you can do that if you're tough enough. Oh, self-driving cars, right. <laughs> uh, building communities that don't rely on automobiles with transit. I mean, we're, people think of DUI as a substance problem when really it's an automobile problem. If you can block your neighborhood bar, you're not going to be driving drunk. If you have to get in your car and drive five miles because you live in a suburb that was built for cars and your nearest bar is in a strip mall, So ladies and gentlemen, you've just heard the argument in favor of public consumption for marijuana, right? There it is. <laughs> well stated. I mean, right now you have this right to there are ways around expensive uh, outfits. Um, put the limousine comes to DIA and picks you up and you can start smoking as soon or eating or whatever it is as soon as it drives away. But you're not driving, you're, you know, and the driver is an employee. But it, there's a, a, a mystery writer who wrote a, uh, what's her name? She lives in Maryland, so she's not, but she wrote a, she wrote a mystery based on a, um, an Edibles Hotel here in Denver. Uh, and it, the, it's a piece, it's a, just a joy to read, to, you know, about, <laughs> about each course, is there, what was served, and, and each chapter has a quote from Harry Anslinger. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a terrific novel. I, I wish I brought the title of it. I didn't. I can't remember. <laughs> but it's a lot of fun. <laughs> well, w w sure, I can. you're welcome to the slides, yeah. Um, how, is there some nice way you can do this? I mean... So I'll make sure you guys have a copy, and then if, uh, if you can get it to them. Okay. Well, great. Thank you. Love you, and thank you, Mr. Yeah.